Hello, everyone. Welcome to Amago, Season 1, Episode 38. And our title this evening is Possessions and Position, the Purpose of Possessions. I'm your host, Vanessa Brown. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Possessions and positions. So we are inundated with images of possessions on television, on our billboards, magazines, social media. We have actually become so preoccupied and consumed with the belief that having possessions is what it means to be wealthy. This belief of what wealthy looks like drives our decisions both consciously and unconsciously. For example, it makes us determine the career that we want to pursue, where we want to live, what we want to drive, the clothes we wear, what we eat, or even who we befriend. And in these days and times, it also impacts uh, the church that we want to attend. And the reason why is because this definition of wealth is carnal. Our society defines wealth as an abundance of valuable possessions or money. And the state of being rich, material prosperity, plentiful supplies, or a particular resource. But the New Living Translation puts it this way in John 2.16. It says, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything that we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. This insatiable desire to acquire things will never be fulfilled, and we exhaust ourselves and waste our lives trying to obtain things. This is not why we were created, and it is not God's desire for us to live this way. If you are given wealth by God, his expectations for handling the wealth are not the same as the world's expectations. Jesus teaches us the expectations for handling wealth in the parable of the shrewd manager. And it is found in Luke chapter 16. And so I want to use this parable um, for us to talk about uh, the purpose of possessions. This parable tells us of a rich man who found out that the manager of his estate was wasting his possessions. So the rich man fires him. But in order to protect his reputation and future business opportunities, the manager called the rich man's debtors to negotiate and to reduce the amount that they needed to repay the rich man. The manager's shrewd, and by shrewd we mean his clever and his artful plan, allowed the master to receive the payments that were outstanding and the debtors were grateful to him because he reduced their balance that was should be paid to the, man, uh, to the rich man. This placed the manager in a favorable position with the debtors. Now, for the longest time, I had difficulty with this parable. But then that is really the purpose of why Jesus teaches in parables, right? They are never supposed to be easy to understand, but they require that we have a spiritual ears to hear what he is trying to teach us. Let's go a little deeper by looking at the parable, examining it, but focusing on the three main characters that are found in the parable. The rich man, the manager, and the debtors. First, let's look at the rich man. It's not hard to figure out that God is the rich man in this parable, right? God is the creator and the maker of all things. He owns everything. God gave us dominion and authority over the earth. We find this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, and it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, 
and subdue it. Have dominion over fish, the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God gave man dominion over the earth. Power over everything to possess it. Secondly, God determines who gets access to wealth. Now, when I started studying this, this was the first time I've ever even seen this scripture. And the scripture is actually found in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. And it is part of Hannah's praise to God, right? It says that the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. I think a lot of people don't like to hear that, that God makes a determination about who is going to have wealth, who is going to have great possessions, and who is going to live in poverty, or not always having to live in poverty, but be in a situation where poverty exists. Because that same scripture goes on to say that God also exalts He holds the power to exalt those who are poor, right? And raise them to higher levels. So it is God then who determines who gets access to wealth. And thirdly, God gives us the power to obtain wealth. Genesis 26, 12 through 14 says, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth. So the first character that we need to look at in this parable is God and understand that God is in control of this wealth, these riches, our possessions. They come from God. They do not belong to us. Everything belongs to God. The word of God says that my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. And we are simply given the opportunity to manage what he has given us access to. So the second character I want to look at is the manager, of course. He primarily is the main character of the story. Now, the manager is the person who has control, and we can even say possession, of what God has given us access to right? It doesn't belong to us. We are just asked to quote unquote steward it. We are supposed to manage it. When Jesus left the earth, he gave us the word, John 17 and 14, and the glory of God, which is found in John 17 and 22. And he also gave us the Holy Spirit. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 28, verse 19, he gave his disciples specific instructions on what to do while he was away. Jesus was returning to the Father, and everything that the Father had given him, he left us in charge of. And specifically, it says, therefore, these are our instructions, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So now we are managers of Christ's estate. When we look at the parable, we see that the rich man made the manager or asked him to be in charge of his estate to manage it. Secondly, we see that there now that when the rich man returns, the rich man says that there is an accusation that's made against the manager. Well, we know who is the accuser of the brethren. The accusation was that he was squandering or wasting the rich man's possession. To squander is to waste something, especially money or time in a reckless or a foolish manner. And it also means to generally, it means generally to separate, right? Um, And for example, it's separating the weak from the chaff, like throwing something up in the air um, and then it being separated. It means to squander, to disperse, to scatter abroad as, for example, sheep. Hmm, remember there is words in the Bible about um, scattering God's sheep. 
how the manager uh when how when we are asked to manage and when we mismanage the authority that is given to us god lets us know and he gives us the opportunity to correct our ways much like the manager in this particular parable whatever he was doing instead of increasing the man's the rich man's possession he was causing it to decrease or to be scattered or dispersed and so he has to give an account for that. The manager is called to give an account for his behavior and he loses his position. Well, the same is true for us. If we look at the parable of the talents, it tells us that we are going to have to give an account of what we did with the talent. And a talent um, is seen as weight. A talent is seen as coins or the talent is seen as ability or the gift that God has given you. So the position that you have been given, the the weight of God's glory that is on your life, right? The wealth, the money, the coins that God has given you access to or your ability, your gifts and your talent. You are going to have to give an account to God about how you dispersed how you use that right and again keep in mind that when jesus left he left us with a command he left us with a great commission right and so the manager when he is in this parable when the manager um is is told about how he has mismanaged the rich man's estate the first thing he does is that he evaluates himself. He evaluates what he can and cannot do. Um, he says that he is not in a position, he's not strong enough to go in and dig, right? Uh, to really to do hard manual labor. And he also says that I am not going to be a beggar, right? So he evaluates what he is incapable of doing um, in his own future. And so that is the manager. Now, the third party that we want to look at is the debtors. And this uh, parable really doesn't speak that much about the debtors because the debtors are not aware of why the manager is coming to them, why the manager is reducing the amount that they owe to the rich man. They are simply presented with an opportunity. And they readily accept this opportunity to be in a better position with the rich man, or if we want to call him the master. So these debtors, when they are presented by the manager, the opportunity to reduce their debt, they readily take advantage of that. The biggest point of confusion for me when I first read or began studying um, the shrewd manager's parable is that I did not understand in Luke 16 verses 8 and 9 um, when it says the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are people of the light. And I went, oh, okay, whoa. And then verse 16, excuse me, verse 9 says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So my first question was, why would God commend the manager when we know that he was cheating and looking out for himself? But then if we kept reading verse nine, Jesus explains that. But if you are looking at it through worldly eyes, you won't understand. Jesus is teaching us a lesson about handling possessions. He's trying to help us to understand how we as managers of what he has trusted with us, we should take what has been given to us and help those who are in bondage in order to free them. 
See, the manager was previously doing nothing with what he had been trusted with. He was neither helping the rich man nor the debtors. When the manager finds out that he is about to lose his position, however, he immediately came up with a plan for his new life. And he moved swiftly in doing so to place himself in a better position. So Jesus is commending the manager's shrewdness, not his dishonesty, but his shrewdness. And shrewdness, again, is the quality of having or showing good powers of judgment. And as I was studying this, I again uh, found this scripture in Proverbs chapter 8. And it is verses really 12 through 21, but it says, I wisdom dwell with prudence. What is prudence? Caution in deliberating and consulting on the most suitable means to accomplish a valuable purpose. I find knowledge and discretion. Jesus recognizes that people in the world use wisdom. They use prudence and they are shrewd, right? More effectively than people who believe in him. He commends the manager's quality of showing good powers of judgment. This man, the manager, knew he was about to lose his position and he immediately began thinking about securing for himself a better future. So Jesus is not commending the manager again for being dishonest or using dishonesty. But Jesus tells us what we are supposed to do with our possessions. In Luke 16 and 9, he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth, possessions, to gain friends for yourselves so that when your worldly possessions are gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. See, the world, the wealth of the world, that which we um, now, the wealth of the world now really needs to be considered as deceitful and uncertain. When you think about your worldly possessions, it is not secure. It is deceitful in that it gives us this false sense of happiness and fulfillment. But at any time, our possessions can and may be removed because we are operating in a world system. Therefore, Jesus tells us, use your possessions to secure happiness and comfort that goes beyond the time that you're in right now. There is nothing that we have that's promised that it is going to last forever. So we are to use our possessions to secure an everlasting place. Jesus is telling us, use what I have given you access to, what I am allowing you to possess at this time in order to secure for yourself a place in eternity. And by using it for for friends, what he is making reference to is us using our possessions, our money, our wealth in order to help those who are still in bondage, who who, who really don't know who Jesus is or who don't have a relationship with him in order to build that in them. Because when we do, then we are building for ourselves a better place in eternity. So don't, as the scripture says, don't hoard or build up for yourselves here on earth treasures where rust and moths can can eat them. And at any moment, it can be taken away. And it's not that Jesus does not want us to be wise and securing possession and wealth for the generation that's behind us and for our children. But we are not supposed to be looking at 
the possessions of the world, how the world is um, defining wealth, and to use that again just for our earthly comfort, right? But we're supposed to use the wealth that God gives us to help bring those who are in darkness into light. Because when we do, we establish friends. We, we establish, they are grateful to us for helping to bring them out of darkness. But it's not just the earthly friend, right? It's the friends in eternity. So if you can think about when you leave this life and you go into the next life, that there are those in heaven who will say, oh, it is because um, Vanessa um, helped me to see who Jesus really was or helped me with understanding. They can welcome me into my eternal home, right? So we've got this great cloud of witnesses on our behalf of the work that we did, of the investments that we made in the earth, right? That helped them to gain an eternal home. That is the purpose of our possessions. The purpose of our possession is to help those who don't know Christ get to know him and gain access to an eternal home. And so when we get ready for eternity, they will be our friends there and meet us. I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation this evening. Please visit our website at omegohim.com to check out our coaching and leadership development services. And you can also find us on Instagram, Instagram at omegohim, or join us on Facebook by typing I-M-A-G-O. Be sure to like and share our posts that are on Facebook, and share the word of God with somebody. Make sure that you download the Omega podcast. If you check out the notes section, there is a link that will allow you to support the podcast by subscribing. As we grow, we want to continue to add features that will allow you to engage with us. So please share your comments with me through email. Again, my email is omegohim at gmail.com. We will see you next week. Until then, remember that your possessions have a purpose. Until then, we shall be just like him.